Hi, and welcome to module six of lecture eight. In the previous module, we covered a particular kind of probability mass function related to repeated trials, repeated dichotomous, or in one case, um, um, multi multiple multinomial um, actions. Here, we're going to cover a different type relating to event count data. Now, event count data is pretty much just what it sounds like. It's a count of events. So it could be the number of bills that pass in Congress over a given time. It could be the number of wars observed between states in a given time, and so on. You can think of lots of examples of this kind of data that might be applicable to, to situations in political science or all sorts of sciences for that matter. And um, event count data and event count distributions are meant to apply to this sort of data generating process. Before we get into so many de so details of this, let's discuss the first one to get, so we can get a handle on what we're talking about. The first one we're going to discuss is called the Poisson distribution. This looks like this. So the probability that some random event counts, some random count of events, capital Y, is equal to some specific number of events in a given time period, lowercase y, conditional on mu, which is going to be parameter, the only parameter of the Poisson distribution. It's going to equal even negative mu times mu to the y over y factorial. Now, the even negative mu is out there to, as a normalization constant. If I add this distribution, this probability, over all possible values of y, I must get 1 because some number of counts must happen. If you notice, this thing over here is actually the definition of e. When you sum that, that actually gives you e to the mu. Um, we saw that before when we did the Taylor expansion back in calculus. You can skip that part. Don't worry about it. Not that important right now. <laughs> it's in a footnote in the chapter anyway. Anyway, if you um, if you notice that's e to the mu, e to the mu times e to the negative mu is one. So that's the normalization constant. It's called. It makes sure that the that the sum over all possible values of y gives you one for the distribution as it must for all probability distributions because they must give you some number. Some number must be drawn. Right. So that's the Poisson distribution. I can show you some pictures of that. Again, if you call from before, I'm not going to share draw these things because I'm bad at drawing like these things and it's a tablet. So here's a picture, uh, page 215 of this printing. You can see different um, Poisson distributions based on different values of mu. Um, there you go. Mu here is the average, frequen the average frequency um, of events happening during the given time period. That's necessary to know, and one of the three assumptions that we have to make in order to um, in order to compute the probability the probability um, mass function for the Poisson distribution is you must know mu. It's the central parameter. That's why the probability mass function is conditional on the parameter. And if we don't know mu, we don't get anywhere. So we must we need to know the average frequency of events. So. That's the first assumption necessary to be made. Um, the second assumption is that the Poisson distribution tells you the observed number, right? the probability of observing a particular number of events in a given time period. It's useful when we don't observe non-events. So what's a non-event? Well, a non-event might be a bill not passing. right? It's unclear how you even define a bill not, a bill is not passing. right? Is it because two people came together and didn't come up with a bill? Is it because there's an opportunity to pass a bill because the session ended. Right? What exactly does a bill is not passing mean? Um, so we don't observe the not passing part. We just observe the passing part. So we observe the events, but not the non-events. That's in contrast to stuff we did with binomial distribution, where we observed both events and non-events. Right? We observed if it was a 1 or a 0. All the information was sort of out there that we could keep track of. Here, we're observing only events. So this is these event count data, um, these event count distributions are more useful when you're observing only events. And the third really important assumption is similar to the assumption you made for the binomial distribution, which is independence. If it's the case that observing, say, two wars makes observing three wars more likely later, um, later down the line, that's bad. <laughs> that, then this model is not appropriate for that situation. If, you, if the probability of observing anything changes as you observe things, as it often does, frankly, um, the Poisson distribution is not useful for that, that process because the Poisson distribution assumes that observations of three wars, for instance, is independent of observing five wars. Right? These are independent events. Now, I should say that oftentimes events that do quite 
well satisfy Poisson distribution, for instance, um, traffic accidents at an intersection, um, can often look to be non-independent over a short time period, right? So you might see a lot of accidents just randomly thrown together in a two-year time period, and you might conclude from that that it's a dangerous intersection. However, all random events can have long strings of seemingly non-random behavior, even though if you took a look at the larger picture, it's actually random. You can see that yourself if you flip a coin. Sometimes when you flip a coin, you get multiple heads in a row. It does not mean the coin is necessarily biased. It doesn't mean it's not a fair coin. It means whenever you do anything random, sometimes randomly, you get a string of one particular value or another. If you draw a bunch of event counts from a Poisson distribution every year, sometimes you get a string of years that will have very high numbers. It's not a high probability event, but it will happen over time randomly. And it's not true that you can assume it's not actually, that the events aren't actually independent without a longer stretch of data. Now, if in a longer stretch of data, you still have very high numbers that are unlikely to have been drawn from the Poisson distribution, then maybe something underlying is going on there that makes, say, the intersection dangerous or wars very likely in this area um, or wars building on each other. But you need more data for that kind of thing. But that's the Poisson distribution. Um, and it's a nice distribution because it has, it's you can change the shape, obviously, from those pictures you saw. And it only has one parameter, so it's easier to fit in that sense. Um, the downside is it's a very particular characteristic, which is the mean equals the variance of this distribution, which you can test if, if you go through the rest of this lecture and check out um, moments of distributions and you can calculate this yourself. But um, the mean of this distribution is the same as the variance, which greatly limits the, the sort of scope of the data that are likely to have been generated by a Poisson distribution, right? If you look at real data, um, there are many cases in which the mean is clearly not the same as the variance, right? You need them to be separate, so you can vary the mean separately to adjust to real data. So the Poisson distribution won't always be the go-to distribution for event count data, despite its ease and its um, single parameter, because at times that core assumption of that the variance is the same as the mean is not going to halt. In those situations, we can use a different um, data generating process, a different model for our event count. Here we call it the negative, the negative binomial. So it's, it's related very closely to the normal binomial um, distribution, but this is the negative binomial. The negative binomial um, it is very similar to the, the binomial distribution, but has this one difference that's, that comes up, that's important here. Um, it starts with the same, so the probability that, that the random num that the number of events you observe of a particular type y um, is equal to some number. It's going to be conditional on two things. One, the probability of getting a y, of, of having whatever outcome is associated with this probability. Um, we'll call that p as before. I'm not calling it success here because success and failure can be flipped easily. And for the negative binomial, sometimes you want to flip it. We'll get to that in a second. The other parameter here is r which are the number of the other type of success or failure, um, the other type of outcome. So this is, again, a, a dichotomous outcome. And that's going to equal, it's going to, equal to um, y plus r minus 1 over y, the combination of that. So y plus, one, y plus r minus 1, choose y, times p to the y, times 1 minus p to the r. Okay. Now let's take a step back and ask, you know, where does this come from? Well, the last two terms over here, the last two terms, should be very similar to the um, normal binomial distribution. If we had n actual trials, right, then n would equal y plus r, and r would equal n minus y, so we just like the binomial distribution in terms of the, the powers. What about the, what about the um, combination over here? Well, that requires you to understand what this, what this negative binomial actually is. What it is, is what's the chance of seeing um, y outcomes of type A, given that, you, given that you will see r outcomes of type B and end the trials 
upon seeing the rth outcome of type B. So that's a little weird. <laughs> Let's say it again. This work, the way this negative binomial works is that you continue to take these trials, these independent trials, the same assumptions as before with binomial distribution. They're independent trials. And you, in this case, you have to observe both um, A and B, both outcomes. Success and failure, however you want to define success and failure here, just outcomes A and B. And you keep doing it, observing both outcomes A and B, until you observe the rth outcome B, at which point you end the trials. So, so typically, you could think of it as the number of failures before the rth success, or the number of successes before the rth failure. That's why we switch to success and failure here and just call it an A and B, because they're pretty flexible in what you call these things. The key is to make sure the P in the distribution corresponds to the thing you're counting, <laughs> the chance of the thing you want to count and not the chance of the thing you want to set, right? One minus P has to, has to be associated with the thing you want to set ahead of time and look for, you know, you keep going until you see the rth something, that's one minus P. <laughs> P is the chance of observing each one of the things you're counting. That will be Y. <laughs> as long as you get that right, um, you'll be okay. So you can switch success and failure, which makes this confusing, and I apologize, but um, that is how the negative binomial works. You set a certain number of, say, outcome B, and the chance of each outcome B is one minus P, and then you keep counting the number of outcome A's, the chance of each one is P, um, until you hit the rth outcome B and stop. So again, you count the number of outcome A's until you hit the rth outcome B where the number R is set ahead of time as a parameter of the distribution. Got it. Okay, so there it is. That's negative binomial distribution. Um, I can show you a picture from the book. Again, here you go, page 228 there. Uh, it's down here, and you see this is negative binomial distribution for different parameters. Um, here, um, there's different, different parameter values. You can see how that's different shaped. Um, okay. So, this is again account data, and this is primarily useful for when you want, in political science at least, but when you want to have an event count, you want to have event count data in which the dispersion of your data, the variance of your data, is such that it's unlikely to have to be the same as the mean, and therefore you can't really use a Poisson distribution, so you want to use so this is an alternative distribution that allows you to count events um, without having to actually have the mean and the variance be different. Here there are two parameters here, and therefore you can have a different mean and different variance. Um, you can independently set them to better match your, your data generating process. Okay, so that's it. And again, this is very quick to go through binomial distributions and Poisson distributions and negative binomial distributions. The goal here is mainly to see how we translate the general idea of a probability mass function to specific um, theoretical distributions that have specific empirical um, relevance to everyday process of social science. So that's the point of this. You learn a lot more about these in your stats classes. Before we move on, though, to the next module, we move away from these specific probability mass functions to more general conceptions of expectations um, across distributions. Let's do a couple of short examples to give an idea of exactly um, how these probability mass functions are applied to empirical scenarios. Let's start with the Poisson distribution. So remember again, write it down, the probability of any particular value y is going to be e to the negative mu times mu to the y over y factorial. So if we want to say, let's say for instance, very simply, we have some process, say there, we expect one bill to be passed every year. We have very low expectations for concrete, say, right? Um, in that case, the average rate of bill passing given a time period of a year would be one, so we can set mu equal to one. So we'll set mu equal to one and ask what the chances are given that rate of passing three bills. So all I need to do is plug in y equals three to this function, and what we get is mu to the e to the minus mu times, and sorry, this is e to the minus one, I should plug in one there, times one to the y, that's just gonna be one, times, sorry, this should be three, I should plug in these values here, <laughs> times one to the three is one, times three factorial, that's six, so we get one over 
e times 6. 1 over 6 e. e is around 2.7. 6 times 2.7 is around 16. So it's approximately 1 over 16. So the point is, there's a pretty low probability of actually encountering three bills passed if your average rate of passing is 1. And again, you can change the values here and get different numbers, but this is the general idea. Um, now instead, let's say we want to figure out the probability of uh, in, a, in a negative binomial distribution, I want to do the probability of finding, say, uh, say, two successes or whatever, two of some event happening. Um, we'll go to the war example from the book. Two years of peace um, between war, involving two wars. Right? So there's a war somewhere in there, and it's going to end in a war. I want to know what the chances are of finding two years of peace in that region, given that wars happen one-tenth of the time, because it's horrible. <laughs> um, so we want to do this one, conditional on r equals 2, and the probability of finding a war, which is the y here, which is the, why we have to associate the probability of the war, I'm sorry, peace, associated with y here, so that's 0.9, because the chance of war is 0.1, so peace, which is associated with a y here, is 0.9. Um, so now we have... Um, r plus y, y plus r minus 1, um, that's 2 plus 2 minus 1 is 3, so it's 3, choose 2, choose y here, times 0.9 squared, times 0.1 squared, 3 choose 2 is 3, times point, um, eight one times 0.01. Okay. So now we got that, and we go um, with it over by 2, that's 0.00, that's 3, that's 0.0081, or 0.0243. So that's the probability of, encount of, of observing two years of peace um, that had ended by a second war in four years, given the chance of peace is 0.9, the chance of war is 0.1. So there you go. This is how you would use this kind of thing, and you can think of many more examples, but this is, this is sort of a practical application of this using um, randomly made up examples for how to do this. So this is how you would see this in practice if you're trying to calculate a particular empirical probability. There'll be more examples of this in the problem sets. Um, so now we're gonna move on to expectations in the next module. Thank you very much.